now that we have our government in place, we've talked about the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. We've talked about how Congress functions, the role of the president, and the role of the courts in history. What we're going to do this week in two lectures is look at the First Amendment. Now, we're going to look at it uh, in a little bit of detail, but certainly not as much detail as we could. There are entire classes on the First Amendment. But what we want to look at is just two parts of the First Amendment, the f idea of freedom of speech and then the idea of freedom of religion and the Establishment Clause. And this one is on freedom of speech. One of the things I hope you come away with from these lectures and is not a sense of frustration because I'm going to leave you with more questions than answers in some cases. But one of the things I want you to come away with is a sense of how complicated this is. See, when it comes to freedom of speech, uh, that's one of those things that we all think we know what it means. It's one of those things that is clear that we would say, well, you can't yell fire. Uh, freedom of speech means you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Well, sure you can. What if it's actually on fire? Then you can yell fire. What if it's a line in the play that you're performing? Then again, what if you just think there's a fire, but you're mistaken, but you genuinely thought there was? There's three cases right there where it is perfectly legal to yell fire in a crowded theater. So these aren't quite as simple as, as they might seem. And one of the things we'll take away from both this lecture and the next is that there is no right answer to these because these are changing. These are evolving. The Supreme Court uh, deals with cases every session about freedom of speech or freedom of religion and tweaks its interpretation of those generally. So we are not going to be able to come out of this saying, well, this is exactly what freedom of speech means. What we're going to do instead is pose some questions and you can think about those. Well, here's where we might begin. Is all speech the same? That is to say, is uh, a political campaign the same as gossip about the latest Hollywood star? Are those equal? Should those receive equal protection? Well, the Supreme Court, through its time, has decided in generally no, that some speech is more important than others. And the speech that gets the greatest amount of protection is what we call political speech, speech that is political in its nature. Well, that's, that's good. That might seem uh, significant. But one of the problems is what's political? We have to define that. Uh, if a candidate running for a, a local office is making a speech, well, we might think that that's political speech. That seems pretty given. But what if the, what he's doing in that speech is talking about uh, his daughter's softball game? Is that political or is that personal? Or is the personal life of a politician political? These are the kinds of questions that the Supreme Court has to deal with. Okay, when it is defined as political speech, in other words, when the Supreme Court has defined something as political in nature, in order for you not to have that freedom of speech, there needs to be, the phrase to learn is a compelling state interest, a compelling state interest. This is a very narrow definition. The state, and by that I mean the government, can only take away your freedom of speech if there is a compelling state interest in mind. Okay, and that has to do if it's political speech. It also must use the least restrictive means to take away that freedom of speech. They can't take away the speech in advance, but they can use the least restrictive means to take away your speech if the Supreme Court has decided it's political speech. In that case, there's a compelling state interest. Well, not everything that we might think of is speech is speech. For example, what about an armband? What about burning the flag? What about a tattoo? Are these things speech? What about sleeping in a park? What about stealing a television? Are all of these things speech? Well, in some cases, they might be speech. What if you are wearing a black armband, as they did in the 1970s, to protest the Vietnam War? What if you're sleeping in a park as part of the Occupy movement? Are these freedoms of speech? What does the Supreme Court say about this? Well, some can be speech. Some can be speech. And they are called symbolic speech. And even though they are political in nature, which, as you remember, gets the most protection, they get somewhat less protection than what we call verbal or printed speech. Uh, an armband or a tattoo uh, about the Vietnam War, protesting the Vietnam War, is going to receive less protection than uh, a public address about the Vietnam War, for example. The problem with these issues, though, uh, 
is what is the difference between symbolic speech and behavior? For example, uh, again, let's go to the Occupy movement and I wanna sleep in a city park overnight to protest homelessness. What if the state uh, or the city regulations don't allow sleeping in a public park overnight? Do those regulations violate my freedom of symbolic speech and my protest? What if, is, in other words, is my sleeping here an action that the government can regulate or is it an act of speaking? What if um, I'm caught burglarizing your home carrying out your flat screen TV? And my explanation to the officer is, no, this is an act of symbolic speech protesting the inequalities of the economic conditions of the United States. Probably isn't going to be convincing. I wouldn't try that one. But believe it or not, those are cases that have been out there. People trying to say this is symbolic speech and not action. And the Supreme Court has to try to distinguish between the two. Generally, if the Supreme Court determines that it's symbolic speech, you will get more protection than if you simply have action. Well, is all speech protected? Political speech gets the most protection, but does that mean that we can say anything we want uh, and it might be less restricted, anything? What about obscenity? Now, obscenity is one of those things that uh, is difficult to define. One Supreme Court justice said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Well, that's, that's one definition, but does that really mean that we're going to leave it up to each individual justice to sort of define it by their own intrinsic standards? Obscenity, how does the Supreme Court deal with obscenity as, and as a balance of freedom of expression or freedom of speech? Well, the Miller test, this is a court case, the Miller test is the one that they use. And the Miller test has come up with sort of three criteria. It says, number one, it's what the average person would consider obscene or pornographic. It has to do with community standards and it has to do with the work as a whole. For example, it's not just if this line in a 400 page book is obscene that the whole work is obscene. And it doesn't mean that if just one person who maybe is um, a little less comfortable with things than others doesn't get to decide it's the average person. Those two uh, have, have had some success. In other words, going from a, a community, or excuse me, going from a situation where it's the average person and looking at the work as a whole um, have been easily interpreted. The problem has been the community standards because communities change their standards and what do you do in the age of the internet? Where is the community today in the internet? If we're here in Santa Clarita, but we're looking at an internet website that's put out by somebody in New York City or Las Vegas, is it their community standard or ours? Which one should the Supreme Court use? So the Miller test has been important, but it itself is going through some modifications dealing with things like obscenity. Other kinds of speech that are out there, hate speech. Again, the fact that I can have freedom of speech, does that mean that I can make racially uh, bigoted comments? Can I make um, comments that incite people to violence? Can I make comments that are personal in their attacks? Can I defame somebody's character? Can I slander somebody? Can I claim all of this under my freedom of speech rights? Well, the Supreme Court uh, throughout its history has answered sometimes yes, sometimes no, maybe, depending upon the situation. Freedom of expression and freedom of equality are in tension in many court cases before the Supreme Court. You'll be looking at some of those as you do the reading this week. But if I am, for example, my freedom of expression uh, has also been interpreted to be freedom of association. So that means I can associate with the people I want. That's part of my freedom of expression, of expressing myself, just like I can do it verbally, I can do it with an armband. I also get to do it by forming a club. Well, does that mean I have the right to form a club that does not allow people of color? Can I have a school where I'm not, I don't admit people who are African American? Is that part of my freedom of expression, my freedom of association? Does that allow me to not have people around that I don't like? Does it allow me to speak out against that? Does it allow me to advocate that others do things about that? Or have I just crossed the line from speech into conduct? These are all issues that the Supreme Court has to wrestle with. And lastly, not just what you say, 
but the Supreme Court also has to deal with where you speak, and this is called the public forum doctrine. Is there a difference if I am speaking out against a particular, um, a particular business on a street corner? How about in front of that business? How about in front of a mall where that business has a shop? How about in front of your house at two in the morning because you work for that company? Are all of these equally protected? And the Supreme Court coming up with what they've called the public forum doctrine has decided not really. There are places that are public forums. City parks, for example, would be a classic example of a public forum. That is a place where people generally gather to share ideas, and so you're allowed to gather there to share ideas. Private property is, by definition, not a public forum. You know, my front yard is not a public forum. It is my front yard. But more than that, there are what they call time, place, and manner restrictions. Okay, this goes back to the sleeping in the park exercise uh, that we talked about before. Time, place, and manner. Yes, you do have the right to sleep in a public park, but not maybe overnight, because if the park closes at 11, that's gonna violate the time, place, and manner restrictions of your freedom of speech. So not only, uh, one of the things I want you to take away from this is not just that freedom of speech is, is complicated, I hope you're learning that, but that the Supreme Court, as it decides these things, doesn't always uh, lend itself to simple answers. Again, it might have to do with whether or not it's political speech or not. Is it symbolic speech? Should one get less uh, protection or more protection than the other? What about things like hate speech or obscenity? And then time, place, and manner restrictions as well.